So welcome back. I'm here with Clayton again. Hey, Clayton. Hey, Grant. It's good to be here. Uh, so we're just going to talk a little bit about Wall Street Survivor, his update, or using a virtual account to invest with. Uh, also, we're going to talk a little bit about Buffetology. So he started listening to Buffetology, or you can read it, and that was his last assignment. And so we'll just see if he has any questions about that that maybe will relate to you guys as well. Okay. So about your virtual trading account, uh, what's the status? Any updates with it? Uh, yeah, I mean, overall, I, I've lost a little bit of money, actually. Uh, so I, I had invested 50000 and uh, after our last talk a couple times ago, uh, I decided I should not short Google because, as you mentioned, uh, Berkshire Hathaway had gone up to $220,000 or something. So the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though in my mind I had that uh, this idea that a stock price could not go up forever and that Google was pretty high and so I should short it, uh, actually yeah, that was a pretty bad mistake. Luckily I sold 24 out of the 25 uh, shares that I had shorted and I, I just kept one so I could keep tracking and see how bad it would have been. And it would have been very bad because okay. uh, Google keeps going up, and uh, I keep losing money on that on that short. So yeah. don't short. Yeah, but I mean it could go back down. You don't know. But anyways, we did talk about it being a riskier decision to short a stock. Right. And you had talked to me, I think, about the movie The Big Short. Right. Or right. Uh -huh. And I just watched that. I did. And okay. so I think maybe a lot of people, after they watch this movie, The Big Short, they might get very enthusiastic about shorting companies and things like that. And you can make money doing that as well. But we just talked about it last time that it adding uh, more unnecessary risk than you need to. Yeah. So if you want to gamble more or add more risk, then maybe you want to do that. Otherwise, I, I don't do it. Also, also on the, the value investing, which is you know, what we're focusing on here, uh, Google is a new tech firm. We don't know the future. So that's a, uh, like a, like a, another strike against you know, betting on or against Google, I mm -hmm. think. On the Wall Street Survivor, I also have Facebook shares. Uh, and, and that has not fared so well either. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, in real life, uh, I would probably you know, take get out of Facebook because it doesn't align with the, uh, the Buffett method or you know yeah. what, what we've been studying, what you've been teaching me. But keep in mind, how long has it been since you opened up this virtual account and you've been trading? Yeah, not, not so long, just, just a few weeks, right? Yeah. So that doesn't really tell you much about you know the stock okay. going up or down. So with value investing, we're looking at more of the long term. So anything with just in a few weeks or a few months, it's not going to give you a real feel for what's happening with the company or the value of it. So don't get into that trap where you see a stock go up or down in one week or a month or with even a year, and then you get so worried, like, oh, I made a huge mistake. Right, right, right. Yes, you know, because that's not, that's not the case. The price that it fluctuates within this amount of time, it's too short. So it doesn't necessarily equal the value of the company. Remember we talked before about uh, Benjamin Graham saying that the short term is more of a voting machine mm -hmm, right. and the long term is more of a weighing machine. So short term is more about emotions and trends, popularity of a company, whether it goes up and down. Right. And then in the long term, maybe five years, 10 years, this is more the value of the stock, the weight of the value of the stock. Okay. Well, I was, I was definitely in that trap then. Uh, I, I'm just like realizing this now that you say it. Yeah, I was kind of measuring, well, I, I, I was playing the popularity game, I guess. Like, are my stocks winning mm -hmm. at this moment? So yeah. Not kind of a pointless exercise. Yeah. yeah. And we also talked about Mr. Market before. Mr. Market is irrational. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Market will just give quote you some price, ridiculous price for a stock that's really high, next day really low. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mean anything as far as the actual value of the stock. So you don't know what 
what the price is going to be tomorrow. So don't feel like, oh, that's that's the value of the stock, and I made a huge mistake. Right. You know. So, well, even though the the prices is what I was focusing on, I still think I made a mistake on what I chose to invest in because. Well, I mean, we made that company list. I, there were some big names with some, some cloud and whatnot. But you know, now that I, I've uh, you know learned from you some and listened to the the book some and uh, you know gotten into the value investing a little bit more, I see that the firms that I chose were not very good. Uh, like uh, not the type of investments that I want to make uh, if I want to be a value investor and you know win in the long term. Okay. Yeah. And that's good. It's a learning process. So you can see some difference, like from a few weeks ago, the decisions you would have made then and the decisions you would make now. Totally. So that's what it's all about. Just, you know, learning each step of the way as you go. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that I did make those investments back then, because I, if, if I had not have been using the Wall Street Survivor, I wouldn't have any like kind of mental record. It'd be easy just to like throw away that mm -hmm. that uh, memory. Uh, I wouldn't remember it. But now, you know, using the Wall Street Survivor, I have this like kind of virtual account of my mistake. Yeah. So it's very helpful to have that. Yeah, and it's hands-on learning. Yeah. And, and you're learning each step of the way, which I believe you'll retain it much longer. I think so. The lessons will mean more to you. And, you know, don't feel like you just have to learn a lot right at the beginning and learn everything at the beginning, and then you're just going to go in and invest. I don't recommend that for anyone. I mean, it's a learning process. Set up one of these virtual accounts and, you know, just practice. Just play with it until you get a feel for the stock movements and the markets movement and how to make trades and set limit orders. Because there are these small uh, like nuances of, of investing and you don't realize what they are until you actually go through the process and do it. And then you can, you know, work on your uh, strategy. Yeah, yeah, right. This is one question that uh, people might have uh, and that is, when, like in my situation or theirs, when will I be ready like, uh, to actually invest? I think a lot of people, um, like one of the reasons I got interested in investing is because I sold my home back in America because I've been living here and suddenly I have some, uh, some money from the, um, you know, what was left over after selling the house uh, mm -hmm. and I, need, I feel this like, there's a line in the buffetology, like the money's burning a hole in my pocket, right? I have yeah. that feeling, like I'm, I'm losing out right now. I need to invest it right away in something. And, you know, the good point is that motivated me to you know, start looking into this and like we got in contact and, and it's really been helpful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at, is there a certain point when I will actually be ready to start investing? Like, when does that come? Yeah, like I would say it's different for every person, Okay, you know, but... Uh, I would say you at least need to get maybe a few months to feel, you know, how, how the market moves within a week, within a month, within two months, so you get a feel for that. So I would say that's probably the bare minimum to have, like, at least two months of practicing. Okay. Uh, some people will need more, and then you can also gauge it by how much money you have to invest so you might say, I'm ready, I'm confident to invest $500 now, but I'm not confident to invest $50,000. Right, so, okay, that's your point. So that'll, that'll matter as well. Point. Okay, good. And then how much energy you want to put into learning each step of the way and implementing it. Because if you just try to soak up this knowledge without applying it and then just jump right into it, then I would say you're not ready yet. So if you've had experiences and you've practiced and you've made mistakes and then you've improved on those, then you'd be more prepared to do it in real life. So I'm gathering like there's not really a black or white black and white answer, right? It's different yeah. for everybody. But also, um, like you can kind of uh, slowly like dip your toes in. Like if you want, like the five hundred dollars yeah. might be okay. With some people, maybe it doesn't set in when they're investing with a virtual account because it's not real. Okay. Okay. You know, so if that's you, 
and maybe you actually do have to put some real money in the game mm -hmm. and just a small amount to get that real feeling of losing the money or you know the ups and downs to gauge your emotions right right uh, but other people the virtual account is just fine for them to help them to learn but at a minimum i would say you need at least two months of practicing somehow to get a feel for the market and how to invest and trade. Sounds good. Yeah, so Wall Street Survivor has been nice and I, I've, I've learned a lot from it already. And uh, especially I've been able to take what I've learned from you know value investing from you and from the Buffett books and uh, being able to reflect back on my history and see kind of how far I've come or how much my mentality has changed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's huge. Like. Uh, it's a, like a paradigm shift in thinking. Yeah. It's, it's a totally different way of looking at, at investments. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're feeling what I felt when I first started learning about it. I, I thought just investing in stocks was gambling. It's like going to the casino, basically. Uh, but after I started you know, reading the Warren Buffett way, Buffettology series, these things, uh, and started learning about Benjamin Graham, then I felt like this makes sense, you know, it's common sense and it's a logical approach and it's based on fact. So, yeah, I can see value investing and how it works, you know. So, yeah. I do agree. you have any of that feeling or something that changed? Well, de definitely, like, uh, especially after the crash around 2008, 2009, and well, and in various crashes, like the gambling or the uh, casino. Uh, Thought, yeah, I think a lot of people do like treat it as a casino or like you know a blackjack table or something. Mm -hmm. They're just like placing bets here and there and you know hoping for the best. Yeah. But uh, yeah, with this like paradigm shift in as far, I mean, I guess Buffett's been doing Graham. They they they're old hats at it, right? They've been doing it a long time. But for me, it's totally new. Yeah. Uh, and so now that I you're making me aware of this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm able to see it in a totally different way, which is there's, oh, I guess you could still treat it as a, you know, craps table, but uh, why would you when you can do this logical approach, facts based approach, become like an owner of a business mm -hmm. and, and actually uh, make a sound investment based on those facts? Yeah. Like, yeah. Then it's not. Like, other people might still be gambling away their money and, and doing foolish emotional bets, but uh, that's not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's recap so far what you've done. Okay. Um, you made a list of companies that you wanted to buy. Uh, you set up a virtual account to try and buy some companies to practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you've read or listened to Warren Buffett way. Mm -hmm. uh, you started to listen to Buffettology series by Mary Buffett, mm -hmm. and I have to correct myself, but I thought there was no relation, but she was married to the son, I believe, Peter Buffett, but they're divorced now, so no relation again, but <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there was a relation, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. yeah that's right. Actually, I, so I, I don't know how much we can talk about today, but I, I finished the Mary Buffett uh, Buffettology book. Okay, so, all right. It's like four different. I did the audio book, which uh, is an abridged version, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's the main points. Yeah. So let's just kind of uh, get an impression of what the Buffettology series is. If some people haven't read it yet or haven't listened to it, and something maybe you liked about it or what you didn't like about it. Well, uh, I like that she has an inside scoop. So talking about that that connection, so like the way she kind of put it uh, was that she never would have written this book if she were still in the family. Mm -hmm. But after you know the divorce, yeah, she was sworn to secrecy when she was married to a Buffett. Yeah, yeah I would, she did say something like that. I I thought that was like kind of a metaphoric, you know, not actual. Yeah, maybe she was literally yeah, sworn yeah, to secrecy. Yeah. Like, uh, One way or another, she kept quiet about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yet, uh, you know, here she is kind of telling the inside story. I don't, 
Yet I, I wasn't that surprised by the method because uh, it, it seems like value investing, like, and you've brought a lot of things to light for me. There were not that many like new insights on, on the method uh, exactly. Uh, she laid it out kind of nicely, some steps and whatnot, and gave some good uh, examples. But uh, overall, she just had some details here and there that you could not get from anywhere. And so having that inside perspective was really helpful in a few different places. Okay. So yeah. I, I thought that was nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe the, the basis of it was that she was kind of describing how Buffett goes about investing. And he first focuses on finding a good company. Right. He doesn't care about the price at all. He just focuses on finding the good company first or several good companies. And then he just waits until they hit this price that he wants. So he finds the good companies, or a handful of them, and then he values them. And then he just waits for that moment when they hit his price, and that's when he buys. And he buys aggressively. You know. Right. Uh, Andrew Carnegie said, I believe it was him that said, uh, you get rich by putting all of your eggs in one basket and then watching that basket closely. So that That's kind great. of contradicts what other people say, you know, in the investing world yeah. about diversification and everything like that. And that's what Buffett does as well. He invests in a few companies and he puts a lot of money into those when he does best, invest. Yes, like so some of that had been covered already in the Buffett way or at least hinted at. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think she did a good job of describing it more in a way that kind of sunk in deeper yeah. and, and maybe just the more repetition she even like suggests and you've suggested like listen to it several times mm -hmm. because you'll get something new every time but uh, for example uh, the Buffett way talked about um, live, like in your life there should be 20 big decisions that you make or something like that 20 mm -hmm. big investments but I, I heard uh, Terry Buffett she said 10 yeah, she yeah. said 10 yeah. Yeah. so anyways it's just yeah giving you that idea that you should be sure when you're going to invest in a company and that this is with the mindset that you're going to hold it forever or for at least 10 years, you know? Right. I'm not saying you are necessarily going to hold it that long, but you should have that mindset when you buy it. Right. And that makes sense. So it's a hit a few home runs instead of like mm -hmm. a lot of singles or something like yeah. that. And then the other thing that she goes into is talking about how Buffett, uh, he intends to hold these companies forever. Okay, so that can go against what the way that a lot of people invest uh, because they feel like they have to be more active. Mm -hmm. And uh, with my own strategy, I buy with the intention to hold for at least 10 years, but I'll typically end up selling within a month or two months, and I'll take a 2.5% gain or 5% gain, something like that. And you can do that, and you can make a lot of money doing that system as well. But I want you to keep in mind, it really depends on um, the vehicle that you use to invest. So for example, I do this kind of investing more in my IRA mm -hmm. because it's protected from taxes. Okay. So I'm not having to pay the taxes on those trades. So I could trade multiple times in one month if I want to. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I could be still getting that fee, the trading fee that I have to pay like $7 a trade or whatever, but I don't have that huge burden of taxes until after I take the money out, which might be when I'm, you know, 67 years old or whatever it is for like Roth IRA. Right. On the other hand, if you're investing in just like an individual account, which is not a retirement account, then every time you sell that stock, you have to pay capital gains taxes on it. Right, right. I'm, I'm familiar with this. I have a feeling if, if some people are newbies that that might like go yeah. right over their head. Yeah. Like, cause because that's, that's another conversation, like a uh, Roth IRA, regular traditional IRA, mm -hmm. uh, like a personal account within a broker. Like, uh, 
it's kind of confusing, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the vehicle you said. Yeah. But uh, within that, so within those vehicles, depending on what your your tax liabilities are going to be, uh, that might affect how often you trade. Yeah. So you have to be smart about it. I mean, you have to look at these things in the beginning. Like first, what kind of account you're going to set up. Well. Do this later on. Just with your practice account, don't worry about it. Right. But later on, you know, you have to look at what kind of account is going to work out better for you. And then you have to think of your strategy, your investing strategy within this account. Mm -hmm. So how can you, you know, keep the most money as possible? Right. So if you're doing like an IRA, the power of compounding is huge. Right, right. And that's what builds the wealth. I mean, that's what they were talking about in this in this audio book in the Buffettology right. series. Right. It's the compounding. So, so you'll take that 2% or whatever percent for, if you don't have to pay taxes on it, you'll just take it and build up the percentage. Yeah, I mean, because I've been doing this and I know that I can use like the BTMA stock spreadsheet or analyzer mm -hmm. to find a new good company at a bargain price Right. almost every day wow wow so it's very it's a very fast and easy process to do this um so i have that luxury of getting into a new company and then selling at five percent or two and a half percent or whatever and then just taking that and then reinvesting it but if you're just investing in a, an ordinary individual trading account where you're going to be taxed every time that you do that then that might not be the best for you because right. you have the trading fees, whatever, seven or ten dollars per trade, plus you're going to have the taxes each time. Right. So in that case, you're much better usually just to buy a really good company at a great price and then just hold it, hold it. Yeah. for the long term. It, the Buffettology book, uh, Mary Buffett's one, she also said, um, when companies pay dividends, that, that's another way. Yeah. Like a lot of investors think, oh great, they're paying me money. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point that the Buffett way made and you made, and, and like we talked about before, and it was in this book too, was, well, wouldn't it be better if they took those dividends and reinvested into the company and grew the company even more? Because yeah. that way you don't have to pay taxes immediately on those dividends. You maximize your compounding if they're not paying a dividend. Right. If they reinvest it into the company. So yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah. So, but the problem with that is some companies aren't good at reinvesting the money, so their earnings. Sure, yeah. So if they are good, then you know that you can, you can just l let them, it would be better to buy a company that is good at reinvesting their earnings and then just let that to keep continue compounding. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it's a company that's not good at reinvesting their earnings, then it's better that you get the dividend. Uh, but then you should question why am I holding this company, company in yeah. the first place? You know, uh, so dividends, yeah, that that can be a big issue for a lot of people as well because they automatically think, oh, dividends, that's good because I get paid money. But remember, you have to pay taxes on that money usually when it's paid out to you. Right, and you can't control when, because the company decides when they pay the dividend. Mm -hmm. that, that was another sub-point, was, uh, you know, it, if you're holding on to it uh, for a longer time, then, and you're choosing when to sell it, uh, then you're also choosing, you know, when, what tax climate or what tax situation uh, you will be selling it. And, you know, the, I, Buffett's been at it for a long time. He's seen the capital gains tax go from like 35% to 15%, something like that. Uh, and who knows what his tax situation is anyway. I have not an expert in that at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, but just that you are more in control if you're not like making all these changes, as you said, or getting dividends. Mm -hmm. that, was, yeah. that was something I totally didn't think about. And yes, taxes is part of your equation. Mm -hmm. And then also your age, could make a difference as well because okay. uh, let's say if you're close to your retirement years, like my, my father, he was getting ready to retire a few years ago. And in his case, he kind of wants this 
income each month mm -hmm. to live off of. So in his case, it might be better if he had dividend paying stocks. So he, he's just getting this dividend, you know, consistently throughout the year, and this will help him pay for his lifestyle, you know? Right. Whereas if you're young and you're trying to build and compound your wealth, then it's usually better that you don't take this dividend, mm -hmm. you know, so that'll make an effect as well. I just uh, had the thought, you know, your, your listeners might uh, be of any age bracket, right? Mm -hmm. uh, value investing can be good for them too, because they still want to invest in good companies, even if they don't plan to hold it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, it would, it's a safer investment uh, if, they, if they follow the methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even if they're holding a stock that doesn't pay dividends, they could sell, you know, right. they could sell it. Uh, if they are holding the stock that pays dividends, then, you know, they have the luxury when they're older just to receive that income consistently throughout the year, but they can hold their investment in there. They don't have to sell it, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, you have to weigh out your situation. But these details are things that we can cover more later, but yeah, they were mentioned in the Buffetology series. So it's something to just kind of keep in mind. I kind of like broke down notes for the Buffetology. Okay. Uh, we could like go through it in sequential order, like, yeah, sure. uh, if, if that's a good idea. Did okay. you have any like outliner notes that you wanted to talk about? No, I, I wrote down some notes. I, it was a long time since I had listened to it again, so I just went through it over the weekend and okay. just jotted down some notes of important things, but it's not really in order that much. So, um, so I, I'm not sure if we have time in this take, but uh, or for all four parts, probably not. But maybe we start with part one. Okay. So let's start with part one of uh, the Buffettology, Mary Buffett book, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I like this, so she had one quote, you never really know a company until you own a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an amazing quote because it, it, it focused on that difference that you pointed out to me, that you're not a stockholder, uh, you are a company owner. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, when your own money is involved, then you'll be surprised at how differently you behave sometimes. Right. You know, with your emotions and things. You might be all cool and calm, when you're doing the virtual account or when you're just thinking of the numbers, but when your your dimes there on the table and you know, then your emotions kind of take off. Right. So. Well, I thought too, this, this quote kind of like, it pushes home the fact that you uh, should look at yourself as a company owner. Okay, yeah, that as well. Yeah. Rather than like just owning the stock piece of paper. That, that was in the, the, the Buffett way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, that's one good thing is hearing the same thing a couple of times in slightly different ways mm -hmm. is really helpful because yeah. it really drives home these points. Um, let's see. So this idea of consumer monopoly oh, yeah. uh, came up. And, and we had talked about, you know, monopolies or monopoly-like companies. Yeah. She spent like half the book uh, talking about that. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal, right? right. Like uh, that is definitely what you want to invest in. Yeah, and she had something like nine questions or something that to tell if it's a consumer monopoly. Right, right. Yeah. So what what did you gather? A consumer monopoly is. Well, in the first, I think that's the third part of the third uh, track or whatever that she gets into the nine parts. And I, ha I have those okay. detailed. We can go over that too, um, but. Uh, she gave the example of Coke. Coke keeps coming up, and mm -hmm. it's a Buffett investment. GE, basically that uh, consumers rely upon it, and that uh, hopefully it has, yeah, it should have brand name recognition, and it's uh, it's like the only one uh, company that makes this good. Or even if there's other competitors, they're not real players uh, mm -hmm. because they they just can't compete. Yeah, or it's difficult for them to enter. Difficult to enter. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this yeah. service or product. And there, there could be a plethora of reasons for that. Like it might be that this, like in Coke's case, like not many people drink RC Cola. Like I, I used to when I was a kid, it's cheaper, tastes like cola, but uh, price is not, that's the key thing, price is not the main factor. Mm -hmm. So if, if price is the main factor in motivating a decision to buy something, then it's a commodity, Yeah. right? 
Yeah, they mention airlines. Right, as, right, yeah. Take the cheapest flight usually. Yeah, and how, you know, a ticket used to cost $1,200 from, I don't know, she said maybe Omaha to France or something. Yeah. And then, like, maybe 10 years later, the price is $500, you know? And you could see that even today. If you look at prices 10 years ago and then today, prices are pretty much the same because there's so much competition with price and you'll just choose one airline over the other just based on price alone. That's why it's not a consumer monopoly with airlines and usually not a good investment. Yeah, so it, it, for a commodity, the, the price can go down or the company has to really compete in a kind of cutthroat environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but these, Which pushes everything, everything, all the company's prices down. But the consumer monopoly can kind of like stay above the fray somehow. Mm -hmm. And even though, so what, was it those, was it nine things? That yeah, I believe defined? she had nine questions. And that's whether it's a consumer monopoly or not, I yeah. think. But it, basically it, it's like not, it's not so black and white. Like it's not so like clear cut, right? There's lots of different factors that could kind of make it uh, more of a consumer monopoly or in, in less of a commodity. Mm -hmm. Like, because she mentioned uh, McDonald's, and, and this is like kind of a moment, actually, I think it was later on that she says this, sorry, not the first part, but uh, McDonald's is selling a commodity, actually. They're mm -hmm. selling hamburgers. Like, anybody can make a hamburger. Even a McDonald's hamburger is not like so special, really, right? It's just mm -hmm. meat, ketchup, I always get a cheeseburger, so some like basic American cheese on there, a couple like very generic looking pickles. It's about the most generic that they could get. Mm -hmm. But McDonald's is a consumer monopoly because people think hamburgers, they think McDonald's, they think like that's a, mm -hmm. a restaurant. They think these yellow arches. Right, right. Happy Meal. The fry, golden yeah. fries. Tell, tell a kid it's just a hamburger, so there's no difference. We're not going to get McDonald's. We're, we're going to make hamburgers at home tonight. Right, 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 right. 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 Yeah, so it's more you're buying the feeling and everything around it, the brand name. So it, it, it's like uh, it, it's there's a there's a lot that goes into whether it, you might think oh hamburger commodity, but actually McDonald's took a commodity and made it into a uh, consumer monopoly. Mm. So yeah, I, imagine uh, a big city without McDonald's. You yeah, know? yeah. That that was that was another point she had uh, was. She, she had this, uh, I think it was a later part of the book, she says, like, go into a convenience store, look at what's there, and, and you can kind of see, imagine a convenience store not carrying Coke, mm -hmm. right? Or not yeah. carrying, like, Wrigley's chewing gum. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have this product, then they're going to lose. They're going to lose money. They're going to lose profits each month. So that will really tell you if you have a consumer monopoly or not. And that's what you want. Yeah. yeah that uh, customers rely on this product and also companies rely on it as well. Restaurants, they have to serve Coke or Pepsi, you know? If right. they don't have one of these, then, you know, they're going to lose money, customers are going to complain. Right, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I would feel very strange without Coke or Pepsi in a restaurant. Yeah. Even if I'm, yeah, it's amazing how deep it is. And, and you don't really realize that. This kind of is like a new lens to look at the world, you know, you, you see, mm. oh yeah, there's these certain things that like, companies have done a really great job in like, putting their, setting themselves apart somehow, see yeah. a recipe or mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, so you want a consumer monopoly, then at, uh, at about the 7.15 mark, uh, she says price was the most important factor. And I mean, this, this is one of those things that just keeps getting beaten into me, and the more I hear it, the deeper it goes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the more real it seems. Got to get a rock bottom price. Got to get a rock bottom price. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there, uh, you know, you said he'll identify a good company, but then you have to wait for the price. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and my old mentality was just get a good company. Yeah, that's it. Make your money work and just invest in something. Get started investing and just buy a good company. I think a lot of people just want to get into the game. 
Yeah. So they'll they just take whatever price, you know. But price is really important. Right. right? Yeah, the most important. 